Good morning, Grace 12. We are starting with the real content for Chapter 7 today. Um, it is quite a long lesson. I'm going to record the whole lesson today, but then I won't, see, won't send another lesson tomorrow. So then you have the two days to work through this lesson because it is such a long one. Right, the topic of this lesson is non-compulsory insurance. So if we just look very quickly again at the meaning of insurance, Remember, insurance refers to the cover that we can obtain for a possible event that may cause a specified loss or damage. Remember what I said in the previous lesson also, when we talk about insurance, it is basically taking out cover for a specific event that might or might not happen at some point in the future. And because of that event, you might suffer some losses or damage. Okay, so when we talk about insurance, um, there will be an agreement between the insurer and the insured. Remember, the insurer is the insurance company, and the insured is the business or the individual that would like to take out insurance. So when you take out an insurance contract, you are entering into an agreement. And according to this agreement, the insurer, the insurance company, undertakes to indemnify the insured, the business or the individual, in the event of a specified loss or damage. In other words, we are transferring the risk. The insurer is going to take over and carry the risk on behalf of the insured. Obviously, for this privilege, the insured, the business or the individual, have to pay a premium for specified losses or damages that is covered. I did explain in the previous lesson that the, when you take out insurance, they will obviously assess the risk. They would want to know what eventualities you would like to insure against, and they're going to look at your situation, the location of your business, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to determine how big the risk is, what is the likelihood of this event happening to you, and then according to the risk, they will calculate a premium that you will pay either monthly or annually um, for in return for the insurance cover. And then obviously the higher your risk, the higher the premium will be. So if the likelihood of things going wrong is big, your premium will be higher. If there's only a small likelihood of those events happening, your premium will be smaller because the risk is less. Right, so an insurance contract is the contract that you enter into. It's the contract between the individual or the business that requires to take out insurance cover and the insurance company that is taking over that risk. Right, so all um, contract law will apply here as well. Obviously, both parties will have to agree. Both parties have to be honest and transparent about the facts behind this insurance contract. But it's a written contract between a person that would like to take out insurance, would like to pass the risk on to somebody else, and then the insurance company that is willing to take that risk. Right, now when we talk about non-compulsory insurance, non-compulsory means that it is voluntary insurance. Every person, every business has a choice whether they want to enter into insurance contract or not. It is not required by law. So it's not something that you legally are obliged to have, but it is something that is good for a business or individual to have because it does provide protection for businesses and for individuals. So it's taken out, as I explained, in order to transfer the risk of something happening onto the insurance company. So you as the business or the individual you no longer have to carry this risk. It is no longer your risk. It becomes the risk of the insurance company. So it's one thing less that you have to worry about. All right. It's not compulsory. It is not required by law, but it is something very, very good to have so that if something goes wrong, you will be paid out and you don't lose financially. So the risks can include, this is not obviously an endless like the, the only things on this list, but the risk that can happen, it can include theft, it can include damaged cars as a result of a car accident or something like that, damaged buildings as a result of a natural disaster, an earthquake, flooding, a fire, 
It includes injuries on the premises, okay, so injuries by the public, ne, public indemnity. When members of the public come onto your premises and they get injured, it can provide insurance for that as well. We will look at a more extensive list later on in this lesson. Non-compulsory insurance is divided into two groups. We have short-term insurance and long-term insurance. Short-term insurance is basically taking out insurance on assets, on things, now your car, your factory, your stock in your offices, protecting them against things like fire and theft. Long-term insurance is about insuring people, all right, so the life of people or to make provision for retirement. So the insured will enter into a legal insurance contract with the insurer. And remember, we did mention in the previous lesson, the insurer might be represented by an insurance broker. Obviously, Sunlum as a business, you, it's, like, it's not a person, right? So they will be represented by an insurance broker, somebody that is qualified who works at Sunlum. You will deal with the broker, and they will be the one that signs this contract on behalf of Sunlum because the business can't sign. Okay, certain so insurance concepts, this is very, very important that you understand this. When we talk about over-insurance, this means that whatever you are in taking insurance on, like for example, if you're insuring a vehicle, if you insure that vehicle, for a value that is more than the actual market value. So you are paying a higher premium because you are paying for an item, a value, a monetary amount. You are insuring a car for more than what it is actually worth. All right. So for example, if your car is worth 300,000 Rand, but you insure it for 500,000 Rand. Okay. Now the, the trick here is, that should that car get damaged, you will not receive a payout that is larger than the value of that loss at market value. So if you over-insure your assets, you are paying a higher premium, and when that asset does get damaged, you are not going to receive more money than what that car was actually worth. So over-insurance is really stupid. Now, it is not very clever to over-insure your assets because it pushes up your premium, so it's costing you more per month or per year, and when the risk actually happens, you will not receive the amount of money that that item was insured for because that is not what that asset is worth, even though you paid the higher premiums. So you are basically losing money by over-insuring your assets. Okay, so it also means the extra money that you paid for the premiums. They're not going to say, oh, but I shame, ne? You, you now paid for this higher value and it's not really worth as much. Let us give you your money back. That doesn't happen. That's how they make their money. Ne? That's how they make their money, by have, taking people's premiums, even if those premiums are not going to be paid back. They're not going to say, okay, but the premium should have been 200 rand less a month because the car wasn't actually worth that much. So that, that 200 rand extra that you paid, we're going to give that back to you. It doesn't work like that. All right. It is up to the insured to reassess his insurance policy once a year. Your insurance is your insurer is not going to phone you and tell you, listen, um, I happen to notice that your car is like insured for 500,000. I'm sure that it's been depreciating all this time. Don't you think you should revalue this car a little bit lower so that we can decrease your premiums? They don't do that. You have to go to them. Okay, everybody that has insurance, it is the insured person, the business, the individual, it is your responsibility to review your insurance every single year and you to tell them, listen, my car is no longer worth 500,000. It is now only worth 400,000. Please reduce my premium. Under insurance is obviously the opposite of over insurance. This occurs when property or assets are insured for their full market value. Okay, so you take out insurance to cover you for the full market value, but the asset is insured for less than the current value. All right. So the, the, what, what it's actually worth as a result of depreciation is more than what you are insuring it for. Okay, so it's insured for less than the current, the book value 
of that asset. So, for example, in this case, your car is worth 500,000, but you insure it for 400,000. People do this so that they can get a reduction on the premium. However, if you are insured for less than the actual market value of your assets, you are only going to be paid out for the amount that the goods are insured for. So if you have insured your car for a value of 400,000 Rand, even if it is worth 500,000 Rand, they are not going to pay out 500,000 Rand because you are underinsured. They will only pay out the amount that the goods are actually insured for. There's a calculation in this case. Okay, there's a clause called the average clause. They need to calculate the amount of money that you will be compensated in proportion if those goods are underinsured. All right, so they literally have to work out proportionally wise. If the average clause kicks in when you are underinsured and you've insured the car for 400,000, but you you've pay you've insured for 400,000, but the car is worth 300,000, they are not going to pay you out that, that 400,000. They are going to apply the average clause to calculate the amount of money proportionally that they're going to pay out based on what the car is insured for and what the value actually is. Right, so how does the average clause work? Okay, the average clause is a stipulation, as I said, that it kicks in when goods are underinsured. So whenever you, you take out insurance policy and you insure your assets for less than what it is actually worth, and something does happen, yeah, the asset does get damaged. As I said, they are not going to be paying out what your asset is worth if you have insured it for less. Then they're going to use this calculation to calculate how much of the damage they are actually going to cover. So they're going to pay out in proportion to the insured value. This is how they're going to calculate. Ne? That means that the insured, that the company, the individual, is still responsible for a part of the risk. In other words, they're not going to pay out the full amount of the damages that was caused to your vehicle based on what it was insured for. They will use this average clause to calculate how much of the damages they are going to be covering and how much of the damages you yourself as the business are expected to cover out of your own pocket. Right, how are we going to calculate the average clause? We're literally going to take the insured amount, the amount that your asset is insured for. We are going to divide that by the market value of the insured item. So what is it actually worth? If it was 100% and you could sell it, what would you receive for it? That is the market value. And then they're going to multiply by the total amount of the damage or the loss. Okay, so the formula looks as follows. The amount that your asset is insured for divided by the value, the market value of the insured item, times by the amount of damage. What, what, what is the amount of damage that was caused to this vehicle? This is an example. Okay? Peter owns a thatched house valued at a million rand. He is insured his house, he has insured his house with pro cover insurers for 800,000 rand. A fire in the kitchen causes damages of 30,000 rand. Okay, the thatch house, immediately near the risk is already high because thatch houses burns easily, more easier than other houses. So his value of his house is a million rand, but he only takes out cover for 800,000 rand. A clear example of underinsurance. He has insured his house for less than what it is actually worth. Okay, a fire in the kitchen causes damages of 30,000. Yes, his matric daughter is at home because of COVID-19 and she decided she wanted to make pancakes and this is what happens. Right, now, what we need to do is we need to calculate the amount that ProCover Insurance will pay Peter to cover the damages, yeah, to fix the kitchen. Show all calculations and then explain to Peter the reasons why he did not qualify for the full amount of damages sustained. When we do the calculation, remember, 
to be safe, you write your formula down first, then you substitute, and then you calculate. Remember, I did mention in the previous lesson that in business studies, if you only write down the answer and the answer is correct, you will get your full marks. But I will not take a chance. If you show your calculations, you show your steps, then it is easy for your examiner to see where you went wrong and the parts of your calculation that is correct, you will still get some marks for. If you write down just the answer and it's wrong, you're going to get zero. Right, so what is my formula? Insured value over market value times damages. So in this case, his, the, the, his house was insured for 800,000. The market value of the house was a million. The damages was 30,000. So the amount that the insurance will pay out is going to be 24,000 rand. All right. Peter is going to have to cover the rest of the 6,000 rand. He's paying that out of his own pocket. Okay. Why? Because he insured his house for less than the market value. Okay. So in other words, his premiums was lower because he insured it for a lower amount. So he hasn't been paying to receive a payout of a million rand. All right because his asset was insured for less than what it was worth. Okay, so he was underinsured, so the insurance company will use the average clause to calculate in proportion, out of the value of the house, how much of these damages they will cover. Okay, so as I said, the insurance company will pay out 24,000 rand for the damages, and the rest of the other 6,000, Peter will have to cough up himself. The next concept we're going to look at is reinstatement. Okay, now every insurance contract has a stipulation where it stipulates that the insurer may replace lost or damaged goods instead of reimbursing. So in other words, if your asset gets stolen, reinstatement means instead of paying out in cash so that you could buy another asset, the insurance company might choose to replace the asset instead. So if your jewelry gets stolen, instead of paying out the monetary value of the jewelry, they are going to refer you to their jeweler and you can go and buy jewelry. So the insurance company is replacing that jewelry instead of paying out for the amount that it was worth. This stipulation normally is applicable when goods are over-insured. Okay, so normally there's a case of overinsured. Remember, they, they, you cannot be placed in a better position after insurance or after the, the risk has happened than before. Okay, that is like unethical. All right. So sometimes when goods are overinsured, instead of paying out, because they cannot pay you out an amount that is more than what your assets was actually worth, they rather replace the assets. Right, and as I said, the reinstatement value, it cannot be higher than the market value of the loss. We are not supposed to benefit from insurance. It's not a money-making thing. The idea is that the insured, the person, the company, the business is restored to almost the same financial position as before the loss. Now, they're just they're reinstating you. They're putting you in the same position that you were in before the loss or the damage happened. They cannot put you in a better financial position. If we look at this example, a business property has been insured for 300,000 rand, but the market value for the property is only 200,000 rand, ne? over-insured. If it is destroyed by a fire, the insurer is going to rebuild the property instead of paying cash. Ne? They're not going to give you 300,000 rand because your property wasn't worth 300,000 rand. Even though you paid the higher premiums, it doesn't work like that. The property was only worth 200,000 rand. So instead of paying out the, the money for the asset, for the property, they will opt to use their contractors and they will rebuild the property for you. So you still don't lose. Okay, so reinstatement applies when assets are over-insured, insured for more than the market value. And in this case, there's no formula for calculating overinsurance. It is only in the case of underinsurance, when the average clause kicks in, that you are going to be required to do a calculation. In the case of overinsurance, 
There is no calculation. Remember, the insurance company will not pay out more than what your assets was worth. Right, in terms of excess, um, I've noticed when I went through the slides that on the new examiner's notes, there is no mention of excess. I just left it in its one slide, okay? Normally, there's a clause in most insurance companies that states that the insured, the individual, the company, is responsible for a fixed amount of the claim every time he submits a claim. This clause is in insurance contracts to prevent insured people, individuals and businesses, to claim unnecessarily. All right. Like, for example, if there's fire damage to the factory, if there's a clause of excess, it can specify, and the, the, the insurance contract will specify that every single time that you make a claim, you have to pay 5,000 rand yourself. All right, that is called an excess. So every single time that you claim, you have to pay a certain amount. So obviously people are not going to claim unnecessarily just to get stuff fixed unnecessarily because every single time they claim, they have to pay this excess né, in cash. All right, and the excess has to be paid before the work actually gets done. So if, you're, if it's individual insurance, if your geezer bursts, for example, okay, you put in a claim to the insurance company, when the plumber comes to fix the geezer, you're going to pay your excess, let's say a thousand rand. You have to pay the plumber a thousand rand, that's your excess. The insurance company will cover the rest. Plus, if it's caused damage to the paint on the walls and you want it to be repainted, the insurance company will send a painter. You are going to pay a thousand rand because now it's another job that needs to get done. The rest of the money will be covered by the insurance company. If the carpets was destroyed, they will replace the carpets. You will pay the excess of a thousand, and then the rest of the insurance company will pay. So on one little incident, you might be required to pay a three thousand rand excess. So if, for example, the walls, the, the water ran over the walls or whatever, you are going to think twice about saying, no, 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 it needs to be repainted. Maybe it just needs to be rubbed down. Eh? It reduces people from claiming unnecessarily. If we force them just to pay also a little bit themselves. Otherwise, it's too easy to just call out the insurance company for no reason. Right, so what is insurable risk? What is in uninsurable risk? Insurable risks are those risks that can be shifted onto insurance companies to minimize the financial impact of the loss for the business or the individual. So any risk that can be shifted onto an insurance company is insurable. Okay, so, so any risk that can be carried by an insurance company. So any risk that the insurance company is willing to carry on your behalf. Non-insurable risks are risks that cannot be shifted onto insurance companies. You cannot ex expect an insurance company to, to carry this risk on your behalf. The business or the individual must carry these risks themselves. So because this risk cannot be shifted onto an insurance company, the business or the individual will carry this risk themselves and it's impossible to work out a premium. Okay, if, the, if the insurance company is not willing to transfer the risk upon themselves, obviously they are not going to be able to work out a premium because they're not willing to take these risks on behalf of the business or individual. The difference between over-insurance and under-insurance, most of this we have done. We're just kind of going through, okay? Just again in a table form in case they ask it like this. So when there's over-insurance, remember we said property is insured for more than the market value. So it's insured for more than what it is worth. In this case, the insurer can choose to reinstate the insured, which means instead of paying out the money, the insurer can opt to replace the asset that was lost. And remember I said businesses will never receive a payout that is larger than the value of the loss at market value. You cannot benefit from insurance. They will never pay out more than what the asset is actually worth. With underinsurance, it is the opposite. Your property or your assets are not insured for their full market value. So it is insured for less than what that asset is actually worth. 
In this case, the average clause is going to kick in. We're going to use the calculation to determine the proportion of the portion of the, the damage that was caused that the insurance company is going to cover. And obviously, the rest that is not paid out, the insured person, he has to cover that amount himself. Okay, so businesses will only be paid out for the amount that the goods are insured for. And obviously, if the goods doesn't disappear, if there's damage caused to the asset, as I said, we will use the average clause to calculate proportionally how much of those damages the insurance company will actually cover. Difference between insurance and assurance, also very important. Okay, in the case of insurance, it is based on the principle of indemnity. We are going to look at the principles just now, okay? But the principle that kicks in with insurance is indemnity. And in the case of assurance, it is the principle of security. All right, I'm going to explain this more just now. In the case of insurance, the insured, the individual, the business, transfers the cost of a potential loss to the insurer at a premium. All right, so in other words, the risk is transferred from the insured, the individual, the business, to the insurance company. In the case of assurance, the insurer undertakes to pay an agreed sum of money after a certain period has expired or on the death of the insured person, whichever one comes first. In the case of insurance, insurance is based on a potential loss. It is based on something that might or might not happen. Okay, a risk that might or might not happen. They might break into my factory. They might not. My factory might burn down, but it might not. Okay, something that might or might not happen. In the case of assurance, it is based on something that will definitely happen. Okay, you are either going to die or you are going to reach a particular age, right? And whichever comes first, your, your life insurance, for example, the policy will say um, it is going to pay out in the event of you turning 65 or if you die. So if you die when you're 40, it is going to pay out when you're 40 because that happened first. If you live and live and live and you haven't died by the time that you're 65, it will pay out when you reach the age of 65. Ne? It says whichever occurs first. All right, but after a certain period has expired, when you reach a certain age, or in the case of death. Okay, so with insurance, as I said, it covers a specified event that may or may not occur. Specified event. Now, in your insurance contract, you must specify. Okay, theft, um, accident, burglary, whatever. You must specify exactly what is going to happen. You can't just say if anything happens. It's a specified event. Okay, in case of assurance, as I said, the specified event is certain. It is going to happen. You are just not sure when it is going to happen. Eh? The time of the event is uncertain. Insurance is applicable in the case of short-term insurance. Eh? Short-term insurance is insurance. Long-term insurance is called assurance. Okay, examples of insurance. We take out insurance on our assets. Eh? Our assets, our houses, our properties, our factories, we protect them against theft, burglary, fire. In the case of assurance, we can take out a policy on somebody's life, né? so life insurance, endowment policies and retirement annuities is policies where you pay premiums every month, and obviously when you reach retirement age or when you reach a certain age, a payout is going to occur. Right, just distinguishing quickly between short-term and long-term insurance. Examples, now examples of short-term insurance will include your property. Okay, if you take out insurance on your property, your assets, your furniture, your car, your house, your factory, the machinery in your factory. Money in transit, okay, obviously the, the banks will have this kind of insurance. Theft, burglary, fire, and the long-term insurance, endowment policy, Okay, retirement policy, life insurance or life cover, retirement annuities or pension fund or a provident fund. In all of these cases, it's making provision for something definite. Okay, after a certain amount of period has passed, your money is going to be paid out. All right, so you're paying a premium and then a certain amount of money will be paid out at a certain point in time. 
Most life insurance policies also includes a disability policy. So, for example, in the policy it will say, if ever it happens that you are injured in an accident and that injury causes you to lose your hand, a limb, some kind of a disability, a certain amount will be paid out. Yeah, that's part of a life insurance policy. Okay, trauma insurance. Yeah, if something traumatic happens, you can take out cover for that. Funeral insurance. Yeah, it's long-term insurance. Health insurance or medical aid. It is all part of long-term insurance. But contributing to a medical aid, that amount that you pay per month, that is your premium. When you go to hospital, they are, the insurance kicks in and they pay out. Okay, in other countries, it is called health insurance. In our country, we call it medical aid. But it is all part of long-term insurance. This is important. Okay, what we're going to look at now is the four principles of insurance. And we are going, this is very, very important. This is something that they ask very, very often. You must be able also to recognize this from a scenario. Okay, so the first principle is indemnification or indemnity. Okay, as I already said, indemnity applies to short-term insurance, and indemnity means that basically that the insured, the person, the company, is compensated for a specific loss. All right, so indemnity kicks in in the case of when damage is caused, when that risk has happened, when the theft has now happened, and the insured person is paid out by the insurance company to compensate for his loss. So the insurer agrees to compensate the insured for damages or losses that is specified in the contract in return for the premiums paid by the insurer. All right, so this is the basis of your insurance contract. The insurer is basically promising that if certain events should happen, specified events, né, specified theft, damage, accident, fire, water damage, whatever, those events are specified the insurer promises to pay out, to compensate the insured person or business for losses should those specified events actually happen. And in return for this, the insured person, the business has to pay a premium. Okay, so it protects the insured against specified events. Now, as I said, it has to be specified in the contract. If you didn't specify in that contract specifically that you want cover for fire, fire damage. Then if your factory burns down and it wasn't specified in your contract, they will not pay it out because that wasn't one of the specified events. So you have to specify the events, the risks, okay, and then it, the insurance company protects you against those events that may or may not occur. Remember, it's insurance. It may or may not happen. Payouts from insurance companies will only be made if there's proof that the specified event took place and you can prove the amount of loss. Obviously, we have a lot of insurance fraud nowadays, okay? So, obviously, insurance companies also need some kind of guarantee. So, you have to prove to them that the event took place. Normally, what the insurance companies will do is they will send an evaluator they will send it to you, to your house. Now, if you claim that your factory was hit by hail, the person, the evaluator from the insurance company is going to come to your factory to look whether there was really hail damage. They look at your factory, they look at the surrounding areas to make sure that the hail didn't magically just fall down on your roof, then you faked it, okay? And then you must prove the amount of loss. So, for example, in the case of theft, if your stock was stolen, you have to have a system where you can prove to them, this is the amount of stock that I should have on hand, and yet there is nothing. In the case of individual insurance, you have to show them receipts. If you want to claim for the fanciest Apple laptop and iPad and fancy jewelry and whatever, you have to prove to them that you actually owned that stuff. So you need valuation certificates, you need photographs, you keep your receipts of the assets that you buy, because they're not just going to believe you that you had uh, whatever big ass TV or whatever, you have to prove to them that you did have it and now you don't have it anymore because it was stolen. All right? It's good faith. The amount of indemnification or compensation is limited to the amount of provable loss. Okay? Even if the amount in the insurance contract is higher. All right? So even if you've insured it for a much more 
If you can prove, they will only pay out of what you can prove. So if you said you had 10 TVs, but you can only give them proof of ownership for 8, they are only going to pay out for 8, even if you insured for 10. Okay, they must be proof. Okay, the whole principle here is that the insured must be placed in the same position as before the occurrence of this damage. So as I said earlier, we cannot benefit from insurance. The whole idea behind insurance is that we are placed in the same position that we were before this occurrence of this risk or this event. Okay, we may not profit from insurance, we may not benefit, we may not be in a better position before or after the accident than before. The second principle of insurance is security or certainty. And this kicks in in the case of long-term insurance. So in the case of long-term insurance, the insurer undertakes to pay out an agreed amount in the event of loss of life security or certainty. It is something that is definitely going to happen. The event is certain, but the timing is uncertain. So a predetermined amount in the contract, obviously the amount is agreed upon. That amount will be paid out when the insured person reaches a predetermined age or gets injured due to a predetermined event or dies. All right, so you can take out insurance, for example, that will pay out when you reach the age of 60 or 65 or 70 or whatever, or you get injured in such a way that you can no longer work. And in the case of that injury and disability occurs, it will pay out a certain amount of money. The aim is to provide financial security to the insured person at retirement. Remember, retirement age generally is 65. So after 65, people can sometimes no longer work. Certain businesses, the government, for example, they're not allowed to employ people over 65. But um, obviously, you, you need to make provision. Eh? Just because you're 65 and old doesn't mean that you stop eating and drinking and having needs. So you still have to satisfy your needs. And the aim is, of this is that while you are working, during all the years that you are working, you contribute to the fund by, via the premium. And in, that, in the case of turning 65, the, the insurance company will pay out and you can use that money, obviously, to live on until such a time that you die. All right. Or in the case that if it should happen that you were to die before you reach the age of 65, the money will still pay out and then provide financial security to your dependents. It provides money for the people that you are leaving behind so that they can satisfy their needs. The next principle of insurance is utmost good faith. This means that the insured has to be honest when supplying details when entering into the insurance contract. Okay, in other words, we're not going to lie about anything that is going to affect my insurance contract. The insured person, the individual, the business must supply the correct details so they cannot lie about things that they own or that they don't own or what the value of these things are. Both the insurer and the insured must disclose all relevant facts. So from the insured, for example, as I mentioned, you have to be honest in terms of the assets that you own, the risk that is applicable in your, in your instance, um, the value of the assets that you own, the insurer has to be honest in terms of exclusions, né? which kinds of claims are excluded. If there's an excess to be payable, the insurer have to notify you about that. Okay, everybody, both parties have to disclose all the relevant facts and both parties have to be very honest. The insured must also disclose everything that may affect the extent of the risk. So, for example, you cannot claim or you cannot say in the insurance company to the insurance company that your car, your trucks is locked up in garages overnight, but then it isn't. Now, then you are lying. If it is locked up, that reduces the risk and therefore reduces the premium. So if you say that they are locked up overnight, they have to be locked up overnight. It can happen that if you lied, that you said, I don't know, it's locked up in garages and then it gets stolen and it wasn't locked up in a garage, it can actually happen that the insurance company will refuse to pay out 
because your dishonesty in the beginning, it wasn't you, the contract wasn't entered into into good faith. You were lying. Okay, the information supplied when we claim must also be accurate and completely true. A lot of people is doing this where they lie about the value of the stuff that was stolen. They lie about the stuff that they owned that was stolen. This is dishonest. Now, just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean that it's okay. All right. So we cannot say, yes, I owned a one carat diamond ring, but I didn't. Okay. When uh, the loss does happen, we have to be honest about what was stolen. We have to be honest with regard to the damage that was caused. We cannot lie. The next principle of insurance is insurable interest. Okay, this is also very important. This means that the insured person, the business, must prove that he or she will suffer a financial loss if that insured object is damaged or lost or disappears or whatever. So before the, an insurance company will be willing to insure an asset, you as the insured person have to prove that you are going to suffer a financial loss if something happens to this object. So in other words, I cannot take out insurance on my friend's cell phone because I don't, I'm not going to suffer a financial loss if my friend's cell phone is stolen. I must prove that I personally will suffer a loss if X, Y, and Z is going to happen. Right, and this insurable interest must be expressed in financial terms. So in other words, this financial loss that I am going to suffer, what is the value, the monetary value of this financial loss? How much in monetary terms do I stand to lose if this asset is damaged or stolen? Okay, in other words, what it boils down to is the insured person or the business must have a legal relationship with the insured object in the contract. So in other words, I must physically stand to lose something if something happens to this object, not somebody else, me personally. The last thing that we're going to look at is just the advantages or the importance of insurance for businesses. First of all, it does transfer the risk from the business to the insurance company. So the, the business itself doesn't have to carry this risk. If a loss should happen, they will receive a payout in order for them to make right what was lost. Obviously, the transfer of risk is subject to the terms and conditions of the insurance contract. So obviously, at the time when the insurance contract is taken up, obviously, certain terms and conditions will be agreed upon. So if it is in the terms and conditions of the insurance contract that the alarm system will be activated in the factory overnight and you forget to activate that, in, that, that alarm, the insurance contract could become null and void. You did not stick to the terms and conditions. Okay, So it's very important. It's always subject to terms and conditions. It protects the businesses against dishonesty by employees because, again, you can take out insurance for things like fraud, né? for when your employees steal money from the business. You literally can take out insurance for that. It protects a business against losses due to the death of a debtor. So if somebody owes you money and that person dies, you can take out insurance for that. Now, it's not your fault that the debtor passed away. It is not your fault that the debtor is now not paying. He was a good debtor. He had a good credit record. You gave him credit. But unfortunately, he passed away before he could settle his debt. You can physically take out insurance for that. Obviously, it protects the business against different risks, net theft, loss of stock, damages caused by natural disasters, accidents, anything like that. If assets get damaged, Obviously, it costs a lot of money to replace. And if you have insurance, you don't have to pop out the money from somewhere. Obviously, the insurance company will pay out the money so that you have cash available to replace these assets. Also protects businesses from claims made by members of the public. That's for damages that the business is responsible for. So in other words, if your product harms a person, okay, so your product, like for example, with the Viennas, yeah, if the Viennas makes people sick, you have public liability insurance for that. Okay, so if your something goes wrong in your production process or something happens and your product damages or courts hurt or makes people sick or whatever and they actually open a court case, 
you can take out insurance for this, need to pay out members of the public for the damages that was caused to them. Also, if they come into your store and they slip and they fall and they break their leg, they can physically sue you because it happened on your premises. So you also take out insurance for this. This is also a good one to have. Businesses will be compensated for insurable losses, as I mentioned earlier, to replace lost assets. Now, if your property burns down, to replace that property and all the stock inside of your factory, that is going to cost you a lot of money. So you need to have a backup plan. You either need to save that money for in case, okay, but lots of people don't have the discipline to not touch that money, right? But it helps us to have insurance because if your property should burn down, the insurance company is going to pay you out or they're going to rebuild the factory for you so you don't have to worry about the financial loss. Okay, so if it was insurable, it is that back door and it protects us. Valuable business assets also must be insured. Okay, obviously, any asset of the business that needs to be replaced is going to cost a lot of money. So if we have insurance, we don't have to worry about the cost of emplacement because the insurance company will pay out. Businesses can also be protected against the loss of earnings during strikes, for example. So when your workforce goes on strike for an extended period of time and you are unable to produce and sell anything, you can also take out insurance to protect you against the loss of earnings. Okay? All the money that you are not earning during that time because your workers are unable to or not willing to come to work. Also, the life insurance can be taken out on the life of a partner in a partnership okay, to prevent unexpected loss of capital. Remember, you have to prove an insurable interest. But in the case of a partnership, if both people are contributing, both partners Obviously, if the one partner should pass away or something will happen to him, the other partner is going to suffer a financial loss. Okay, same with married couples. Okay, you can take out life insurance on your husband's life. Now, if your husband is the breadwinner, obviously, should he pass away, you stand to lose. Now, there's a financial loss for you because the breadwinner is now no longer there. So you can take out life insurance on another person provided that you can prove that you are going to suffer a financial loss. In the business, if the services of key personnel is lost due to an accident or a death, the proceeds of the insurance company can also be paid out to the business. All right, so the business can take out life insurance on the lives of some of their key personnel. I'm not saying everybody that works there because that doesn't work like that, right? But a business can take out, for example, life insurance on the life of their managing director, okay, or their whatever, their chief financial officer or whatever, okay? If it's a key, a strategic person, a person that is absolutely vital, he performs a very important function in this business. And without this person, the business is going to suffer a financial loss. We can take out life insurance on those key personnel, in which case the business will be paid out if such people would then either get into an accident or die or whatever. Okay, I mentioned this one also, the replacement costs of damaged machinery and equipment. Obviously, that's very, very high. It is extremely expensive to replace the machines or equipment that was stolen or damaged. And obviously, if you take out insurance and it's properly done, they can be um, covered completely. Okay, so whenever that machine breaks or gets stolen, the, the total cost is replaced by the insurance company or it can at very least reduce your payment. So you don't have to cover the entire cost of producing or replacing that machine. You might be able to or might be required to pay that excess. Remember that a part of the cost to cover that yourselves or in the case when you are underinsured, it can be a problem, but the majority of the cost will be covered by the insurance company so it reduces the financial burden on the business when these things happen. Okay, I did mention Okay, just the difference quickly between insurable risks and uninsurable risks. Insurable risks are risks that are insured by insurance companies. So in other words, the insurance company will decide on the likelihood of that event actually happening, and then they will decide are they willing to insure you against that risk or not. Okay, so any risk that is that the insurance company is willing to insure against is an insurable risk. And then, as I said, they will obviously assess the risk. They assess the risk means they're going to think, what is the likelihood of this happening? Okay, well, how, what, how likely is it that the truck is going to get into an accident? How likely is it that there's going to be theft out of your factory? How likely is it that the factory is going to burn down? 
the more likely it is, the higher the premium is going to be. Okay, there's all of your examples. Okay, insurable risk, theft and burglary, if people steal from you, fidelity insurance, money in transit, fire, natural disasters, any natural disasters, damage or loss of assets, injuries happening on your premises, unemployment insurance, all of these are insurable risks. Uninsurable risks are risks that are not insured by insurance companies because the cost of that insurance, the risk, is way, way, way too high. So there are certain things that insurance companies are not willing to insure because the risks are so high and therefore it remains the responsibility of the business. Né? Uninsurable risks, we cannot take out insurance for these things. All right, so in this case, insurance company cannot calculate the possibility of this risk, and because they cannot calculate the risk, they also cannot calculate the premium. So all of these risks will remain the risk of the business. If we look at these examples, okay, losses caused by war. Nobody can predict a war happening or not happening, whatever. No insurance company is going to insure you in the eventuality of a war. Okay, most of the risks that it will happen between placing the order and receiving the goods they will be uninsurable. Once you have placed the order, the risk is now yours until you have received the goods. Once you have received the goods and it becomes part of your stock, it is once again insurable. Changes in fashion, obviously you need to, in the field that you are in, you need to be aware of what is happening in the market. If you as a business makes a bad business decision, and you order a whole lot of stuff that people don't want, you cannot insure against bad business decisions. Right. Shoplifting, okay, you as the business are supposed to up your security systems. You cannot insure against this. Losses caused by marketing malpractices by the business. Remember, we have ethical and unethical advertising. So you cannot have insurance if you make a marketing boo-boo. You cannot insure against that. And then lastly, advancement in technology or new machinery. Also, you cannot, now you cannot insure so that if a new machine were to come available, the insurance company must not pay out so that you can buy this new machine. It doesn't work like that. If your existing machine breaks, they will pay out for the existing machine that is broken, and you can use that money to invest in new technology, but they are not going to pay out for you to buy new technology if your existing technology is still there. Now, you are supposed to, as a business, save money and put money away so that you can make provision, so that if technology does change, you can have access to such technology. You cannot expect an insurance company to cover these costs.